Good afternoon. This is Marshall Davis. I received an email a few weeks ago from a listener in Western Australia asking if I would address the topic of spiritual bypassing. I responded that I had never heard the term before. So this listener replied with a definition from Wikipedia. Spiritual bypassing is, and I quote, a tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid facing unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, and unfinished developmental tasks. The email went on to explain, it occurs when one is unconscious of the ego having shape-shifted itself to take on a spiritual identity of sorts. For example, I am not addicted to gambling because there is no self who is addicted. I am not the doer. I am not the gambler. Gambler. Gambling is happening. Of course, there are much subtler examples of this type of bypassing where people use spirituality to live in denial of mental, emotional, or physical issues, using God as a crutch or a scapegoat, so to speak. So that was a pretty good and complete definition, I thought. And then it just so happened that I was reading a book, I was reading the 2020 book by Matthew Fox about the medieval mystic Julian of Norwich, and in the preface, Mirabai Star describes spiritual paths as a term from contemporary Buddhist psychology. And she says it is, and I quote again, the impulse to check out of painful experiences by means of religious platitudes and practices. So, since I had two references to this, I'd never heard it before, I thought it'd be good to talk about this. And that, I think, that those definitions give us a basic understanding of, of what spiritual bypassing is. You know, I have known that people use religion or spirituality as a way to avoid certain issues in their lives, but I didn't know there was a term for it, and now I do. People want to feel good and not feel bad. Avoid the negative and focus on the positive. Life is hard, and a lot of people are looking for a way to make it less hard, and some look to spiritual teachers who promise that there is such a, a way to stop the bad feelings. Unfortunately, in the process, a lot of people only succeed in temporarily fooling themselves. I imagine such spiritual bypassing is more common than many people think. There's likely an element of it in all of us. It's natural for humans to avoid pain and seek pleasure. It's in our genes, so to speak. It's part of our biological makeup, and it's part of our environmental conditioning. And this spiritual bypassing is just a religious expression of this tendency. Our minds play all sorts of tricks on us in order to protect us from pain. And that can be a source of all kinds of psychological disorders. And this can also be the impetus for many people to begin a spiritual search. People often begin a spiritual search or they start spiritual practices to address some difficulty or hardship in their life, some, some physical pain or psychological suffering that is disrupting their lives and they want to stop. Non-dual teachings can be misused by this desire to flee from suffering. And it can lend itself to escapism. Non-duality says that the self is not real, that the only reality is this one whole. And so people can use this idea as a way to play mental games to avoid feelings, but ignoring problems is never a way to solve them. The problem is that the desire to be free from suffering is itself also the cause of suffering. 
The Buddha taught that. The cause of dukkha is tanha, he said. The cause of suffering is desire. So it's a catch-22. The reason many people begin spiritual seeking is itself the cause of the suffering that they seek to be free of. And this is usually not acknowledged consciously, so people can get entangled in deeper and deeper complicated psychological schemes. It can lead to a life of endless seeking and frustration, going from teacher to teacher, seeking and never finding, or some convince themselves that they found it, whereas they're really just in denial. They have moved the suffering to a, a deeper, unseen level where it will eventually emerge in more clever and maybe more destructive forms. Christianity has historically had some pretty unhealthy approaches to suffering, including punishing the flesh that is too often been seen as evil or bad. Instead of seeking to be free of suffering, some have sought out suffering, thinking that in suffering is salvation from this world. Christianity has sometimes gone too far, seeking martyrdom. But at its best, Christians have a healthy approach to suffering. The original message of Jesus held a healthy approach to suffering. In Jesus' approach, there is neither escape from suffering, nor seeking suffering. Suffering simply is. And our natural emotional reactions to suffering, or possible future sufferings, are to be accepted as well, not denied or suppressed. As Jesus approached the prospect of a painful death on the cross by crucifixion, the Gospels tell us that he was afraid, and he voiced that openly in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prayed servantly, fervently, that there might be some way for this not to happen, but in the end, he knew there was no way to avoid it, and he accepted it, and he surrendered to divine will. Likewise on the cross, he did not seek escape from the pain. He did not drink from the drug that was offered to him to dull the pain. On the cross, he experienced intense spiritual anguish, and he let that come and go as well. Jesus experienced extreme physical, psychological, and spiritual suffering. The spiritual culmination of his crucifixion was when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, Christian commentators have tried lots of different ways to explain this way. Some say that he was just quoting a psalm and that was it. And it's true, he was quoting a psalm, Psalm 22, but he was quoting it because he was experiencing it, and he was accepting what he was experiencing. Jesus' approach to suffering was not to fight against it, not deny it, not suppress it, not find some way out of it or some way around it, no spiritual bypassing, consciously or unconsciously. The spiritual genius of Jesus was to acknowledge that there is no way to avoid the cross. That there is no escape from suffering. That is the counterintuitive solution to suffering. It's a paradox, which is what the cross symbolizes. Jesus taught non-resistance to suffering. Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, resist not evil. And by evil, Jesus meant all that harms us, physical and psychological suffering, which is clear in the context there. He talks about turning the other cheek to one's enemies. You let it come and you let it go. You do not hold on to it nor fight against it. 
You let it be. You don't bypass suffering. You let it go through you. You see that the kingdom of God is in the midst of it, as it is in all experiences. In so doing, one becomes a conduit of compassion for all who are suffering. This is the love that Jesus taught, unconditional love. Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them, about those who were crucifying him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is what Christians see in the cross. We see Jesus' approach to suffering as redemptive. As I said in the previous episode, suffering is innate to the human condition. As long as there is a body, there is pain. As long as there is a self, there is suffering. That was true of Jesus, and that was true of us. So if you're hoping somehow to bypass physical or emotional pain or even spiritual angst, you'll be disappointed. You may convince yourself you've done that, well, what you've really done is simply found a way to deceive yourself. Any spiritual system or philosophy of religion that promises an escape from all pain and suffering in this human lifetime is bogus. Don't believe it. Now, I'm sure people can find ways to reduce the severity of suffering through physical, psychological, and spiritual disciplines. I imagine that Hindu ascetics achieve such control of the body to a great degree. And I'm also sure that the Greek Stoics achieved it as well, as well as medieval Christian ascetics. But that was not the way of Jesus. He was not an ascetic. In fact, he was accused of being just the opposite. Jesus taught victory over pain and suffering and death by not resisting them. Non-resistance. Turn the other cheek. Let possessions come and go. Let insults come and go, he said on the Sermon on the Mount. And from that spiritual practice flows unconditional love patterned on God's unconditional love, who, Jesus says, makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Jesus summed up his teaching on suffering in the Sermon on the Mount by saying, Therefore be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is often misunderstood. That word perfect means full, complete, whole, one. It means non-dual. The Tao this is what Jesus was pointing to. It's the Tao of Christ. This is Christian non-duality. And that is it for today. Grace and peace to you.